Welcome to the Ministry 911 podcast. I'm Pastor Jeff Lehman. Ministry 911 serves on site as a first responder to fellowships and nonprofit organizations, interim pastorates, sacred worship leaders, interactive conference speakers for marriage, family, and youth. Life skills training and 501c3 upstart development are just a few needs filled by Ministry 911, all provided free from charge thanks to our crucial financial partners like you. In our last episode, 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 17 through 18, we considered what it meant for Paul to long for the Thessalonian believers and considered how we could relate to that kind of longing. We also talked more about God's continued supremacy and goodness and how significant that reality really is, especially at times when our plans for fellowship are abruptly interrupted and thwarted. Today, looking at verses 19 through 20 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we will uncover a long-term motivation which drove Paul and fed his ambition for the Thessalonians. By doing so, you and I, in turn, will be faced with the importance of remaining committed to God's plans and to the work He wishes to accomplish through the Holy Spirit in our lives. Let's get started. We'll start by reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 20. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye have heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us. And they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sin alway, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming, for ye are our glory and joy. Rereading those last two verses, 19 and 20, he say, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. You know, as Adam was growing, I kind of developed a special bedtime routine for him. My son, Adam, I, I would sing this song to him that I wrote when he was young. It went something like this. My son, Adam, what a lovely boy here with daddy, bringing me such joy in your jammies colored red and blue. My son, Adam, I love you. And I would change up the words a bit to reflect maybe what's going on in a day, address that I love him when he obeys and when he disobeys in just the same way, regardless of his behavior. And that wherever he would go or whatever he would do, I would love him. Jeffrey Adam, I love you. And I'd continue to stress in the verses that he is a joy to me, not because of anything that he's done, but simply because he is my son. I wanted him to be well grounded in that truth, that my love for him is not dependent upon something, but it is simply there because he is my son. Well, as spiritual sons and daughters, these Thessalonian believers were a joy to Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Should Paul not be able to see them again on earth, As a reward for these missionaries' efforts, the Thessalonians themselves would literally be the hope and joy and, as Paul worded it, the crown of rejoicing on the day that the Lord returns to Paul, 
because God's Holy Spirit led these Thessalonians, as well as many other believers, to himself and taught them about the free gift of salvation, specifically through Paul, Silas, and Timothy, who were being obedient to evangelize them. In other words, the reality that these Thessalonians were the hope and the joy and the crown of rejoicing to Paul and the other missionary men was because Paul and the missionary men led these Thessalonians to Christ. And so Paul knew that at the day when he would see Jesus Christ face to face and he would see these Thessalonian believers all in eternity with him rejoicing, he would look at them and consider that they are his hope and joy and crown of rejoicing. They, just by essence of placing their faith in Christ and believing on Jesus as their Savior, were a crown and a joy to Paul. Just like each of us as children, we brought joy to our parents simply because of our birth into their physical family. So it was that these Thessalonians would bring hope, joy, and this crown of rejoicing to these missionary men simply because of their birth into the spiritual family, the eternal family of Christ. Yet, while this is true, there were more who Paul was referring to than just the Thessalonians themselves. In the verse where he says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming. This phrase, are not even ye, indicated that it was not only the Thessalonians, but rather the Thessalonians in addition to other churches, other fellowships, other individuals which Paul, Silas, and Timothy led to the Lord. While the relationship and fellowship which Paul, Timothy, and Silas had with the Thessalonians was an intimate one, in truth, it was not the only one. It was not the only group in which these men found joy. We see this idea of other churches also being ones which would bring Paul calls for rejoicing in the day of the Lord Jesus mentioned throughout the New Testament. In 2 Corinthians, for example, chapter 1, verse 14, Paul says, As also ye, in other words, the Corinthians, as also ye have acknowledged us in part that we are your crown of rejoicing, even ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. In other words, you Corinthians are our reason for rejoicing in the day that we see Christ together face to face. And in Philippians, he, he told them the same thing. Chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. He calls them dearly beloved, longed for. He calls them his joy and his crown. So everywhere that Paul went, all the people groups that Paul took part in evangelizing into the body of Christ would provide reason for joy because they would later be seen in eternity as a crown to Paul worthy of Paul rejoicing about. Yet again, there is still another picture that Paul is including as his reason to consider all the churches as his hope, joy, and crowns of rejoicing. Think about this. Have you ever started a project, maybe with all the gusto you had, only to abandon it, leaving it to be completed by somebody else? Maybe a project at work or a household chore. Maybe you were part of a civic group or a volunteer that had every intention at the start of a role or task to see it carried out to completion, but then after it began, seeing how much work and realizing how much time would be involved, you neglected it. We may have done this with projects, and we may have done it with people as well. Having begun a mentoring relationship, maybe, with high energy and excitement and anticipation of certain fruit being quickly produced and seen in someone's life, only to find that the results hoped for weren't happening quickly enough and deciding from a place of kind of selfish impatience to abandon the work and leave the mentoring 
hopefully, to someone else. Well, there are times when God directs us to leave an intended commitment earlier than we had thought, but when that departure is not directed by God, not only do the other people miss out, but we too miss out. We miss out from being involved as tools that God would have otherwise used to assist him in his relentless path to nurture and cultivate the Holy Spirit's fruit in other people's lives. Well, Paul knew this, and he didn't want to miss out. He did, he did not want to miss out on this wonderful opportunity to remain involved and committed in God's work. Many other things vied for his time, but what was of greater lasting value than walking in the Spirit in such a way wherein the Holy Spirit would be able to use him to help others become more like Jesus Christ? Paul considered the Thessalonians and other churches to whom he ministered to be his hope, his joy, his crown of rejoicing because he knew that if he continued running the course with these believers, if he continued with them and did not abandon them, if he continued nurturing them, discipling them, continued loving on them till the end, he knew that he would then also be able to enjoy with them the fruit of the Holy Spirit's work in their lives when they would all one day be with Christ Jesus together in his very presence. If Paul were to abandon ship, then any work the Holy Spirit would continue to do in these churches' lives from that point on, and the Holy Spirit would continue regardless of whether Paul was involved or not, but that work then would not be something that Paul could take part in enjoying because he would have left the work. He would have left the fellowship or the churches, the people, prematurely. While God's direction and surrounding circumstances often did not permit Paul to stay at a location as long as he wanted or visit a church as frequently as he wanted, Paul remained in touch with these churches by way of sending other laborers like he did with Timothy and by writing and sending direct and encouraging letters to them. It's an art that we've lost today, writing letters. Even to the point of writing about freedom while he himself was bound in chains in order to disciple the very men and women he evangelized. He brought them to Christ and then he strove to disciple them, whether or not he was with them in person. And when he wasn't with them in person, he found ways to send others to them or to write letters himself, encouraging letters to them, and thereby remaining personally involved in the work that the Holy Spirit was doing in their lives. He did so then, as we've seen in chapters 1 and 2, for a number of reasons. Overall, he was compelled by the love the Holy Spirit had been cultivating in him toward these spiritual sons and daughters. He loved them. He was entrusted by God with these messages, not only of salvation, but also of sanctification. He desired to be obedient. He loved them, and he desired to be obedient to God's call. And because of this hope, joy, and crown of rejoicing, which he excitedly anticipated, he wanted to enjoy them, the believers, as the fruit of his care and labor. Friends, these are things that, let's have these three things be some of the very things that also motivate us to be deeply involved in Christ's work. Let ours not be to focus on the wood, hay, and stubble of the world that will merely be burned up, time wasters, found as naught in light of eternity. Rather, let ours be to, walking in the Spirit, open our hearts and time up to God so that He can direct our energies to places and people for whom Jesus Christ died. That we, too, would be compelled by the love of the Holy Spirit to be demonstrating ongoing love for one another, recognizing the reality and importance of the salvation and sanctification messages we have been entrusted with, and anticipating this sure hope, joy, and crown of rejoicing at the Lord's coming in the presence of Christ, so that we too can anticipate being before Jesus Christ and looking around and seeing 
others that we have helped lead to Christ and after leading them to Christ, teaching them more about Scripture, being used by the Holy Spirit to cultivate His truth and His Word into their lives so that we can look around at them in heaven in eternity and see them as our joy and part of this crown of rejoicing that we have in knowing that the Lord used us to build his character into the lives of these other believers. If your fellowship or organization is looking for interim Bible teachers, worship leaders, or conference speakers, send an email to info at ministry911.com. To partner with us or learn more, visit ministry911.com. I'm Pastor Jeff Lehman, Executive Director of Ministry 911. Thanks for listening.